we will start getting NFTs and token from all sorts of sources, right? Like the same way that I'm getting DM'd on Twitter. It's like, maybe you buy a product and you get an NFT. Maybe you play a game and you get an NFT. And, and I'm assuming my kids will have multiple wallets with multiple tokens and NFTs that will give them access to some online events or perks or different experiences in the metaverse that uh, today you, you couldn't really do. Hey everyone, this is Prashant and I'll be your host for the VC ETNX podcast. And today we have Eze Vidra with us. Eze is a co-founder and managing partner at Imagine Ventures. Previously, he was a general partner at Google Ventures, Alphabet's venture arm, the European head of Google for entrepreneurs and the founding head of Campus London, Google's first physical hub for startups now available in seven countries and 30 partner hubs. While at Google, Eze spearheaded strategic commerce partnerships in EMEA and helped launch Google Shopping, Local Shopping and Google Wallet in various European markets. At Imagine, He's investing in seed and pre-seed companies in the interactive entertainment, metaverse, and consumer tech space with a focus on Israel. In this episode, we talk about the three components of the metaverse, why he's so bullish on the gaming industry, will Facebook dominate Web3 too, just like it did with Web2, and the exciting companies he has invested in, and a lot more. So without wasting any time, let's dive straight in. Oh wait, if you haven't subscribed to vc 10 x yet, please do. And give us a five-star rating if you find value in this episode. Now let's start. Hey Azzy, so good to have you on the VC TEDx podcast. How are you doing? Hey Prashant, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. All right, to start things off, can we have your story? Like how did you start investing? Yeah, sure. So I, I actually started my career um, as an entrepreneur. Um, I co-founded a startup in the last year of college um, while working at another tech company. And uh, I developed myself uh, mainly as a product manager. And as a product manager, I wanted to, that, that Israeli that, that moves to New York, I wanted to keep in touch with the local ecosystem. And I started blogging about startups and venture capital, not very different than what you're doing with this podcast. And that's how I, I got to meet a lot of people. And fast forward, um, I was fortunate enough to be asked by friends who I was helping in various capacities if, if I wanted to join their rounds as an investor, or as an advisor. And that's how I first got my my feet wet uh, in investing. But ultimately, my first investing role um, was as a general partner for Google Ventures, um, helping Google Ventures open their European office. And of course, uh, I only got to, to get the full experience as the co-founder and managing partner of Remagine Ventures, which is my current fund, um, investing in early stage um, startups in the space of gaming, metaverse, and consumer tech. Yeah, that's super cool. So while I was reading about Remagine Ventures, it, it sounded very exciting to me and you're investing in very exciting spaces, uh, which is in many ways the future of how we will live in many ways. The metaverse and the gaming industry is also pretty much booming. So let's talk about the metaverse first. What is the metaverse? Uh, that's a billion dollar question, right? Because today it's very hard to put one definition on it, but a lot of people describe it as the future of the internet. And it's essentially a way for us to collaborate, play, um, socialize um, in a virtual immersive environment um, that uh, gives us the freedom to do all those things uh, versus sort of like consuming the internet as a one way sort of like read only, um, you know, like flat screen. Um, so to, for today, a lot of those conditions for immersive experiences happen in the world of gaming. So gaming has become a major portal um, into these future technologies. But metaverse is some, in a simplistic way, it's somewhere a def um, an intersection between sort of like gaming and social, immersive technologies, you know, some Web3 and, you know, there's some part of the decentralized uh, web that uh, fits into that. Um, and it's part of a consumer trend that, you know, we spend much more time online than ever before. If you think about, you know, compare consumer usage habits from 1999, you know, to 2022, the growth in, in internet uh, time that we spend is is exponential, not linear. Um, and we're 
got used to doing a lot of the things that we're, we're used to doing in the real world, also to do them online, from playing to socializing to dating to commerce and, you know, you name it. Uh, so it's very natural that uh, we'll continue to spend more time online and that we'll continue to spend money online. And there's a lot of new technologies that need to be invented for us to, to have it be a great experience. Um, so there's, it might be a long answer, but there's a lot of misconceptions about what the metaverse is and the reality is that no one can really agree on a definition today. Got it. And uh, talking about the metaverse, so, and you're right about the fact that we are increase, spending increasing amounts of time on our mobile phones uh, and that, that can be good and bad, right? So uh, as an individual, I'm trying to limit the number of um, the amount of time I spend on my mobile phone because it's so addictive, right? So with the advent of metaverse, are, are we headed, head, headed towards a future wherein we'll be spending maybe 24 hours a day? Like we are basically connected all the time, right? So will that be good or bad? Because there can be two ways it can work out. One is that you don't really realize that you are online because it's so natural. That's your new reality in a way, right? So in a way, you're not using screens because it's so you're all the time connected. And the other is that you're so connected that it starts starts affecting you that, you know, yeah. which way do you see it? Yeah. I mean, if, you, if you've read, um, you know, Snow Crash, which is the book that... Uh, coined the term that, you know, Neil Stevenson, the author coined the term metaverse uh, over 30 years ago. And, uh, or I think it was actually published in 1982, which is crazy, sort of like how much foresight there was. But um, or if you sort of like watch the movie Ready Player One, it seems like a very apocalyptic, uh, sad version of the future, to be honest. I don't think any of us should be wanting that future for us where you don't even know that you're connected. And, and it also implies sort of like the metaverse is VR, where you're disconnected from the world. And I think the reality is that today, it's sort of like um, we're in the very early days, the very early innings of this uh, space. And it's mostly how we spend our leisure time. And it's mostly around sort of like play and entertainment. Although I do see huge case use cases in education, in health, and in other professional environments where you're able to simulate the real world in the metaverse and therefore actually shorten um, the, the, the time it takes to do certain things like train employees or, you know, solve a problem remotely or help people with mental health, uh, you know, get over fears, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know to tell you how many hours a day we will spend in the metaverse. Like I also read the reports like everyone else and uh, um, there's different assumptions. Um, but I also do think that there are certain things and consumer behaviors that maybe 10 years ago we would have thought are crazy and today are not so crazy. For example, in the future, it's very likely to assume that people will be paid money to play games, right? Like people will have a job as gamers uh, and with play to earn and crypto gaming, we already see the beginnings of it, right? If I told you 10 years ago, they would say like, okay, gaming is a leisure activity. It can't be a job. But now th those yep. things are changing. Also, the creator economy, um, you know, I don't want to jump ahead too much, but to, to cast content into these virtual worlds and virtual environments, we're going to need uh, to democratize the content creation process from companies to people. And in order to do that, you're going to need new content creation tools, distribution, monetization, etc. And I think the metaverse offers a lot of opportunities for creators to, to basically... Uh, enable to to have a direct relationship with consumers to monetize sort of like their fan base to to sell virtual goods and and to do all these things and uh, you know I think that a lot of these the technologies that the, that are going to get invented in this space will probably make us spend more time and more of our activities online. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I, I read about it in your blog post wherein you talk about the three pillars of the metaverse and in, in which one is uh, obviously gaming and the uh, other is uh, there is there is a creator aspect and there is Web3, right? These are the three. Yeah. So uh, can you talk about all these three and uh, wh how these three can come together and what will they make? Yeah, sure. So, so again, it's a... Uh... I think the metaverse is an amorphic term that because we're in the early stages of it, it's when it's hard to agree on one definition, there, there's many misconceptions uh, about what the metaverse represents. The reality is 
there's intersections with every one of those three pillars that you mentioned, but the metaverse is not just gaming. It's not just crypto or NFT. It's not just, uh, you know, like social or VR, but the, you know, there are parts of it. There are, and, and, uh, and parts of it that aren't, there aren't. So we look at sort of like investing in this space, um, a bit like an onion. Um, so at the, at the center of all of this is the consumer. Um, and we sort of like when the markets are large enough, we like to invest in consumer gaming is a good example. Um, you can invest in a gaming company and it can become a big business, uh, that goes public, you know, or, or, or sort of like sells for a lot of money and look at Activision, uh, acquired by Microsoft for 70 billion, which was the, the most uh, lucrative uh, exit in gaming. So consumer experiences at the center all the way of the sort of like the outer rings of this onion is infrastructure and infrastructure can be sort of like in the decentralized metaverse or decentralized web. It can be sort of like blockchain innovation or, you know, ways to, um, create, uh, transactions between parties that, uh, that can be anonymous and done, uh, sort of like remotely without, uh, without the need of sort of like, uh, authentication or third parties, et cetera. And then at the, at, in the middle of it, we sort of like see enabling technologies powering a lot of these consumer trends. So it can be tools for content creation. It can be, um, immersive technology, you know, for sensing, for, uh, for discovery, um, for, um, you know, being able to, to create and, and, and sell assets, um, can be smart glasses or software for these glasses, etc. So there's a whole world of applications that falls into these categories, um, and it ranges from, in some cases, content. Because at the end of the game, at the end of the day, the day uh, gaming is is more of a content investment rather than a tech investment, um, and sort of like all the way out in infrastructure, it can be payments, identity, security, um, you know cloud infrastructure, networks, uh, and then, you know, in the middle, you sort of like have, uh, you know, marketplaces, discovery tools, AI services, automation. Um, so the, the range is quite, uh, quite significant. Yeah, for sure. There is so much in there. It's basically like we are building the internet all over again. So whatever has been built for the internet will need to be built again for the metaverse, right? So uh, also talking about the gaming industry, and that is something that you're incredibly bullish on and you've written extensively about the state of gaming in 2022. So can you give us some insights into why you are so pumped about the gaming industry? And you just mentioned that there are big, big acquisitions happening, big, big exits happening. So what's your take on the gaming industry? Yeah, so gaming is the leading form of entertainment for anyone 50 and below. Um, it's uh, there's three and a half billion gamers worldwide, and it's no longer sort of like this niche Gen Z only uh, type of activity. You know, it, it goes from sort of like moms to young people to old people, etc. Um, and as an industry, it's bigger than uh, sort of like TV, uh, film, and music combined. Um, although the numbers are changing constantly, so maybe, you know, you need to check if it's still accurate, at least that used to be the case, but, uh, you know, gaming companies will forecast to bring something like 188 billion, um, in 2022 in revenue, um, this year, you know, in, in the current, in the last quarter, in fact, uh, it's, we're seeing a, a tiny bit of shake or a small reduction because of the rise in inflation and, sort of like cuts in consumer discretionary spend, but gaming is generally speaking, uh, more recession proof because people in times of recessions or in times of tough markets seek this escapism, um, and the positivity that gaming brings. So we're looking at gaming in a, in a broad stroke, um, sort of like not just gaming studios and content, but also um, gaming infrastructure, gaming creation tools, um, sort of like gaming plus metaverse, gaming plus crypto, um, which is, you know, crypto gaming or play to earn, etc. cetera. Um, and, um, and there, once again, you know, the, the range is, is immense. So we, we've taken several bets, uh, directly as Remagine Ventures into gaming from, 
a company called Revelbots, which is uh, creating a play to earn game um, by an excellent team that's X uh, uh, Platica, it's 888. There's um, another company called Sneaky Panda, again, serial entrepreneurs in the gaming space, creating a new genre in mobile casual gaming, which is the Luck Puzzler. It's a combination between luck elements and puzzle games, which is a genre of gaming. Uh, Toya, which creates experiences for girls in the metaverse, partnering with female IP holder uh, to bring these experiences into the metaverse. And their first uh, hit game is Miraculous Ladybug, uh, which received over 350 million plays without spending a dime on marketing. So that's really exciting because in the past, you needed to spend most of your, most of your budget uh, to acquire those 350 million players. And today they hang out in places like Roblox, which is a virtual world for kids and teens. Um, and if the game is engaging, uh, it will get all the traffic that it requires. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, I'll make sure to put all the links to the companies that you just mentioned so that people can go there and check out those companies. So talking about the gaming industry itself, like it's, it's a, pretty big industry in itself. Like there are different kinds of games. There are games that you play on a different console and then there are games you play on your laptop or your PC and then there are mobile games, right? So mm -hmm. what type of games are you most interested in at Reimagine Ventures? Um, so until now, we, we did mainly um, mobile or infrastructure for gaming. Triple um, A games, which are sort of like the either uh, console games or PC games that can be a, amazing as a consumer experience. I mean, I grew up on those and, and loved every bit of it. Um, it's, a, it's a slightly different type of investment because it's, a, it's more like akin to a movie uh, where there's huge production costs up front and then also the payout um, potential is much higher. Um, but for us, the, the feedback loop on AAA tends to be a bit too long. So we focus um, mainly on sort of like mobile consumer experiences or games in virtual world. Um, I think that there's some interesting challenges that uh, crypto gaming or blockchain gaming um, actually bring in terms of innovation into the, in investing into gaming. Happy to jump into that if, if that's interesting, but uh, we're very curious about that space. Um, and, and on the infrastructure side, I think that there's a lot to do as well from managing 3D content in the cloud. A company we invested in is called Echo 3D. That it's a CDN and CMS for 3D content and recently raised um, a strategic round led by Qualcomm Ventures, the first investment from their new metaverse fund. Um, also like training for gamers, um, helping uh, people that want to become better in gaming uh, improve by understanding their weaknesses in the game and creating personalized training drills. Um, it's a company called Novos.gg. And, and therefore, you know, we, we try to pick something special about uh, the gaming investments we make and typically not to do yet another, you know, fill the gap. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I have an interesting question for you. What percentage of your day do you spend playing games? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably too much, uh, but uh, I see it also as research uh, for work. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, to be to be but, honest, I like to sample a lot of games uh, because it helps me widen my frame of reference. I like to yeah. see, it's a bit like an anthropologist, right? Uh, I used to do it yeah. in my early days of blogging. I used to do it with signing up for betas, right? Like I used to sign up before Product Hunt. There was something called the Museum of Modern Betas. And it was like an early version of Product Hunt. And I used to go and sign up for every product and understand how do they do onboarding? What's my first experience as a user? And then as a product manager, I had a wider frame of reference to like, how do I want to do things? And it's similar with games. I like to see, can they hook me? You know, is the game fun? What about it, uh, you know, made me happy? Um, and then there's some, some games that are not, you know, um, very sophisticated, like Wordle, right? That they create a new consumer habit. It's like, I wake up in the morning, I get my coffee, I want to solve the daily wordle. Um, it's, I have a WhatsApp chain going with a friend that we sort of like annoy each other with our results every day. Um, and I think ultimately for games to be successful, they need to do exactly that. They need to create a new habit where it's not just a, you know, something that you do one-off, it's uh, something that you crave to do more because you enjoy it.
Exactly. And uh, I believe now, by now, it's almost a science how, how you do that. Uh, do you believe that that you can almost kind of, th- there should be a playbook by now that this is how you play, uh, th- how you build a game wh- wherein you can get people addicted to it. So any insights on that, like how, how to build a game that actually gets people hooked? Look, I, I, I try to invest in people that know how to do that. Um, of course, uh, everything, you know, everything has its limits. So you, you don't want to do it too much. Um, so in, in case of Novos, the training platform, they actually put a stop to people. They, they started their first game that they focused on is Fortnite and they help um, their players get better at Fortnite, so like legitimately across all metrics. Um, but they realize that there's also a limit, right? Like if a kid played Fortnite for two hours in a row, basically they say, that's it, you can't train anymore. But by the way, we're happy to introduce you to other types of content. For example, do you want to learn about mindfulness and meditation and the importance of sleep? So I think gaming can be a force for good. Um, it can also be a, a tool that enables people to consume content in a more fun, engaging way. Um, so one of our investors um, is a pediatrician and he cares a lot about kids' education, especially in the space of autism or kids that that have been diagnosed with autism. And he actually told us, look, I I understand very little about what you guys do, but if you have autism, gaming and virtual worlds can be, uh, you know, maybe the only, maybe the best way for kids to socialize, compete and interact with others without the social anxieties that come from personal interactions. Um, So we always try to look for sort of like, can we, make a positive impact uh, with our portfolio companies and not necessarily how do we make this game the most addictive it can be. Yeah, absolutely. And let's talk about uh, talk about Facebook for a bit because they have been in uh, many ways the pioneers of the gaming industry because initially uh, when Fe- Facebook came around and they had an entire platform for the entire section for gaming separately on Facebook and s- some games they like went really big. Uh, One, because of the power of the platform itself. And the other is like, they were individually so good games and addictive as well. And now that uh, Facebook has thrown in the hat by changing their name to from Facebook to Meta. So it it looks like they are attacking the Metaverse as well with full power. And it's likely that gaming will be in focus again, right? Yeah, so, so, okay, so... I, I just re- published a post uh, earlier this week about the 10 companies investing billions um, into making the metaverse transforming into a full metaverse, Facebook or meta, uh, very high on that list. First company within five years. And to be honest, I give them a lot of credit for pushing the boundaries of innovation um, and also bringing these innovations to the consumers. So the Meta Quest 2 um, is the most popular VR headset. Uh, they're creating some very cool haptic technology, etc. cetera. Um, but I, I think it's too early to say, will they be successful or not? Um, I think that Facebook as a company, as a brand have t- has taken a huge beating um, from the public, you know, after Cambridge Analytica and, and different scandals, um, um, with fake news, et cetera, that uh, sort of like consumer trust has eroded. Um, and as we started, you know, we're in very early innings of this. And uh, you write that Facebook platform that enabled the, the growth of uh, companies like Zynga, uh, which was recently acquired by Take, Take Two uh, Games, um, sort of like was built on Facebook platform. But the problem with relying on platforms, and this is, also a warning that we give our, our founders when we invest in a company that is one platform reliant is that when the platform, you know, sneezes, uh, you catch pneumonia. So there's risks with the building on platforms. And uh, therefore, I think people have gone through these cycles enough times that they are a bit cautious, uh, but I, it doesn't take an inch of credit out of what Facebook is trying to do. And, uh, you know, we watch it closely and, um, to be honest, I think that they, they're doing some very interesting things with the Horizon Worlds, with the, their hardware initiatives and uh, how, they're, how they're looking at this space. Yep. Very exciting to watch uh, where this goes. And the battle is going to get exciting with multiple big wigs 
uh, jump throwing in their head that Microsoft is there, Facebook is there, like uh, Google is there. So let's see who wins it or there, there, there is going to be a new winner altogether, right, uh, in the metaverse. Uh, now, uh, uh, switching tracks a little bit, uh, how, how do you see uh, the metaverse and Web3, these two coming together? And how can these two fuel the future of life? So I find the idea of tokenization um, really interesting. Um, I think that um, today, you know, in the early days of the web as well, right? Like there were companies that were created seemingly overnight, raising a ton of money, losing all that money in the dot-com crash. Um, and it, you know, it was tempting to say, that's it, the web is over, right? Like people lost their pants, uh, let's pack up and go do other things. Um, but uh, some of the best companies in the world that we know of today were created, you know, in the aftermath of, of that crisis uh, and also the 2008 crisis. And I think that uh, now it's no different, right? Like uh, a lot of this NFT bubble, you know, was a, an asset class bubble where people were willing to pay a lot of money for a JPEG. And a lot of that is going away. And I think actually it's a good change that is going away because my Twitter DMs are full of people um, offering me some drops or stuff, you know, and like, it's just like, it feels like spam. Like, what do you want from me? You know, like, I don't want to pay $500 for your, you know, picture of a unicorn of a penguin of a bear or whatever. Um, yeah. But I think that you're, you're clearly, you're missing out is you're missing. Out. Uh, yeah. No, I, I have some NFTs and I, I find it, I find it interesting as a, as a collector, you know, I, I collect stamps in yeah. the real world, um, specifically Israel stamps. Yeah. And I, I do like the concept mm -hmm. of like, you know, collecting and, and see like a little uh, work of art that's, uh, you know, maybe it's limited uh, edition or something like that. But I think that utility tokens are coming. I think that uh, we'll start seeing the Web3 become smarter and actually have more purpose that uh, that solves a real problem. Um, you know, I... I I have a lot of respect for Mark Andreessen and what he's done and accomplished, uh, not just in his career as an entrepreneur, but also as a VC. But it was painful to watch him do an interview, not very different than this one, struggling to explain a use case for Web3. Um, I'm listening to these speeches on a daily basis. And uh, in many cases, sort of like Web3 or decentralized web uh, can complicate things. But in some cases, it actually solves a real problem. And... I think we're making steps towards it. Um, it's still very small. Um, so, you know, there's only a few million, you know, low digit million wallets, which means that the number of people participating in this market is still very, very small. So it's not, it's not time for to scale it yet, but where I think it will manifest itself in the metaverse is with, you know, blockchain gaming and, and crypto gaming. And I think that the potential of some of the blockchain technology, um, with gaming to, to transform gaming and unleash creativity is actually large. And I'm happy to explain why. Like typically in gaming, when you invest in a gaming company, a lot of the budget um, goes on, on R&D, right? To build the game. And then about half of the budget goes on marketing. You need to pay Google, Facebook, you know, you name it, uh, maybe TikTok these days, a lot of money to get people to install your game. And if it's a free to play game, you have to make up that investment, um, ideally as quickly as possible, right? So like, let's bombard them with ads, et cetera. Um, so as long as you spend less than you make for acquiring those users and you're able to do this over time and increase the spend, that's a great business. Um, but it requires deep pockets and it sort of like centers a lot of the benefit for Apple, Google, Facebook, et cetera. And these companies that are basically not involved in the creativity, but they own the pipes and therefore they take their cuts and um, they own the access to the consumer. In crypto gaming, um, the companies raise some money typically to develop the game, but in some cases they don't even need to raise the money to develop the game because they essentially pre-sell the characters in the game in the form of NFTs before the game is developed. And they do that by creating a community and ideally growing and engaging that community. Um, by the time the game is launched, ideally they have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people sort of like excited waiting for this game to happen because they bought the token, they bought land, they own the NFT, 
And then when they actually play the game, um, they are able to earn money from from their attention that they spend with the game. So if you play Fortnite, for example, and you spend money on your character buying weapons or buying clothes or, or you know buying a dance, that's great. When you stop playing Fortnite, that character belongs to Fortnite. In crypto gaming or blockchain gaming, if you invest in a character, you know, and you improve it, etc., that character belongs to you, and you can trade that, sell it, um, and in some cases breed it, and you know, make more characters, etc. So I think that blockchain gaming has a lot of potential to change the economics of gaming, and I think that um, a lot of the innovation in gaming will come from that angle. But it's too early to say, you know, like the, there's no mass adoption yet. I think we need to simplify the onboarding of users, like installing a wallet, buying Ethereum to buy an NFT. It's a pain in the neck. Uh, it's just too complicated. Um, but I, I know of some initiatives by some of these large companies that I mentioned in my post that are going to dramatically simplify what it takes for users to participate. And, um, and I also think that we will start getting NFTs and token from all sorts of sources, right? Like the same way that I'm getting DM'd on Twitter, it's like, maybe you buy a product and you get an NFT. Maybe you play a game and you get an NFT. And, and I'm assuming my kids will have multiple wallets with multiple tokens and NFTs that will give them access to some online events or perks or different experiences in the metaverse that uh, today you, you couldn't really do. Yeah, exactly. And I think we're getting this slowly. Uh, but steadily wherein there there are good use cases attached to nfts like right now there are a lot of nfts which no use cases just the aesthetics okay they, yeah. they look cool they look cool so you should buy them and everything everyone is buying them you should buy them but uh, like that's not going to work for long like you need to have use cases like the ticketing use case is a big one and then you buy a product you get an nft that's that's one and uh, and in a game, you buy a character and you own that character. That's one, right? So if, when these come in, then it's going to be more legit uh, right now. doesn't seem so, but yeah, we're surely getting there, right? And uh, when you're investing in the space, you're looking for these things. That Are, are these things there? Are, is the logic there? Is the backend there? Uh, is this actually, is there a value prop attached to it? Is, or is it just a JPEG, right? Yeah, so. absolutely. I think I think ultimately we invest very early stage. So for me, um, I understand that the idea might change. So the team is hugely important um, and the potential of the idea to become a large outcome, I think is hugely important. Um, the rest we can talk about, but uh, it starts from team and market, I would say. Absolutely. All right. So let's talk about our Imagine Ventures a little bit. So what are the kind of investments that you're doing and what are your focus areas and what kind of founders are you looking at? Yes. So great question. So Imagine Ventures 1, which we're currently deploying out of, um, seed and pre-seed fund, investing in sort of like the intersection of tech, entertainment, gaming and commerce. Uh, for us, entertainment and gaming are merging massively and metaverse is a big part of it as well. Um, we've made 12 investments so far. Uh, they split about 50-50 B2C and, and sort of like the, the drivers of the biggest B2C trends, uh, tech enablers or tools or infrastructure. Um, and to give you some examples, on the B2C side, I mentioned sort of like the gaming studios. Um, on the tech enabler side, there's our one that uh, creates synthetic video um, where they can take any person and make them into a virtual character, and then they can generate video from text with AI, and the character can speak any language with any accent. Um, we invested in Vault AI that does the predictive analytics for consumer insights. Um, they work with all the streaming companies and studios to understand where the content is going to work, who will consume this content, how much money is this content going to make, what product categories go with this content, uh, it's really, really interesting tech. Site AI, which does the visual search image recognition. They understand products inside images with a high degree of accuracy, and they're working with a ton of retailers and powering over a billion Samsung phones. Um, so, you know, I would say it's either a consumer when the lar markets are large enough to sustain a VC outcome, and that's mainly gaming or, or large consumer markets. Um, and in other cases, sort of like, the AI, machine learning, computer vision that is powering the trends in this industry. Yeah, sounds great. 
All right. So now moving on to our last rapid fire section, wherein I'll ask you five quick questions, uh, which will be all about uh, Reimagine Ventures. So you have to answer them based on how you invest and where you invest. Okay. So the first one is industry sectors and regions you invest in. Yeah. So for fund one, um, we invest in gaming, metaverse, and consumer tech, uh, both content and infrastructure. Um, primarily in Israel or Israel related. In fund two, we're expanding um, also into the UK and we'll open a London office. All right. What stage are you typically invest? Seed and pre-seed. We tend to be the first institutional investor in companies. So we come either with the angels or right after the angels. Um, and we then follow on and sort of like help the company past the most dangerous parts it's from pre-seed to series A. Right. And what's the typical check size? Um, we've done anything from 300,000 to a million and a half, but sweet spot is probably a million. Got it. Uh, and where can founders pitch you? Um, founders that want to talk to me should find a way to get to me. It's not that difficult. They can pitch me on via email, easy at reimagineventures.com. They can DM me on Twitter. They can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, or they can get an intro, but I think when capital is commoditized, um, you know, I should be easy to reach, not difficult. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, last question, where can they follow you and your blog? Um, so my blog is at vccafe.com. Um, I also publish a weekly newsletter called Firgun, which is uh, congratulating all the Israeli startups uh, that raised money, exited, new funds, etc. And I Highly recommend you follow me on LinkedIn and of course Twitter, which is more of a stream of consciousness. I'm at the uh, Edigs, E D I G G S. Got it. I'll make sure to put all those links in the show notes below, and there'll be a blog attached to it as well. So in case someone wants to read this post and save it or share it, uh, that'll be there. All right, Izzy, it was great talking to you. Great insight Thanks, shared Prashant. on the on the metaverse and the gaming industry and the Web three, and I love to see how you invest the future of living in a way uh, by building the metaverse. Uh, all the best and happy investing. Thanks, Prashan. Appreciate that.